All right, you guys all set? So, um, welcome. Thanks for coming out Sunday morning. I appreciate it. Um, I've known Phil for probably, what, good 12, 13 years at this point. Um, Phil started out helping me out. He came into the first Massive Black workshop that we put on um, down in Austin, Texas, and kind of helped save the day. Um, that's who Phil is. I, I, I look at him as a firefighter and kind of a savant that really knows everything there is to know about cameras and lenses and all that type of stuff that I, confuses the hell out of me. Um, if you guys can, let's give him a nice warm welcome and we'll get started. Thanks, Phil. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Phil Holland. Uh, I am currently a director and director of photography. Uh, I've had a very strange career. Um, but notably, one thing that's relevant to what the topic of this uh, workshop weekend is all about, uh, I've had a lot of experience with animals. And uh, I worked at a visual effects studio's call, studio called Rhythm and Hues for about 11 and a half years, which is a big post house, uh, dealt with animation, primarily talking animals, full CG animals, won a few Academy Awards, a couple nominations, that kind of thing. Um, so I racked my head really hard about how to make this uh, an entertaining presentation for you. Uh, and I wanted to kind of give you a circular concept. Uh, so, you know, I could sit up here and just draw dragons all day, which would be fine, but um, I, pre I prepared some stuff. So that's me. But that's also me. Um, when I was a little teeny piglet, um, my mother was a biologist and we were doing things to save the Tahunga Wash, which is actually now a natural preserve, uh, so it wasn't turned into apartments or condos. Uh, that image on the left actually made it uh, into Sunset Magazine. Uh, you can clearly see I have a monkey in my shirt, uh, which is very strange. But uh, growing up, I had a very strange life, uh, very nature oriented, camping and hiking at least once a month. Uh, and I had lots and lots of animals. Uh, dogs are the obvious one, but we actually had a few hundred reptiles growing up. Uh, we <laughs> basically helped out this company uh, and this guy named Vess uh, to help rehabilitate illegally imported reptiles. So we would have six water dragons in the house suddenly, or a few pythons, or we started raising feeder mice, so we had thousands of mice. Uh, it was a very peculiar way of growing up, and we had some really rare stuff, like um, we had a snake from Africa that was a gliding snake, so it would compress its ribs and fly through the air, which was fun to do if you, you know, let it out one day. <laughs> we had a bunch of birds, I had a horse for a brief moment, a couple goats, ducks, chickens, and we also, I grew up in the sticks, so we had, you know, a farm up the hill, you know, bulls and things like that. So it was a weird combination between exotic critters and sort of standard critters. Uh, and I never really thought much of it because it was like normal for me until like friends who would visit from school would get in trouble for hanging out because like, you can't let my kids hang out with snakes and stuff. And yeah, so. But um, it was a really interesting thing growing up that way. I, I dealt with a lot of critters and dealing with life and death and burying things you're close to, probably more so than the average child. Um, but I remember having really interesting, intimate interactions with animals that kind of stayed with me and that sort of biology thing uh, was basically where things were going for me for a long time. I don't know why I put this other picture here, but you know, it's Catalina and I'm on top of that rock and I'm still a kid, so. So, one of the earliest experiences I can remember is actually seeing uh, Return of the Jedi in theaters. You know, Star Wars was a pretty big impact for everybody here, I mean, this is Noman after all. But uh, so much so, that little Ewok right there named Wicket, I actually wore him on me at all times until I was in my late teens. I used to have him on a little chain and it was really funny because at some point when I was like 17 or 18, I realized I'm wearing like a $300 collectible at all times. And uh, I don't know, it made a pretty big impact on me and it stayed with me. And it was one of those like, 
okay, there's creatures in movies, and we were getting sympathetic to them, right? You've, you've felt things. Now, some of you don't think this is the best Star Wars film, and I'm fine with that. And I'm actually one of the guys who thought the Ewoks were fun, so. <laughs> but we all agreed that this guy was fun, you know? And he's basically a big old dog companion. Uh, man's best friend, literally. Uh, except he wields a weapon, so. The interesting thing is there's a whole bunch of other movies as you're growing up, obviously, and um, for those of you who are anywhere near my age, uh, you know, Never Ending Story was amazing, and you know, you see Falcor and you get all of the feels. You know, that's a whole lot of joy. But on the flip side, you see this, <laughs> and I have one friend who is near 30 years old, and if I show him that picture, he will cry. <laughs> It's, uh, it's still kind of intense. It's interesting that you have so much compassion, so much feeling towards, it's a movie, obviously. We're not actually going to kill the horse, but uh, as a kid, it's so impactful. Yeah. So, then something else happened for me. Yeah. Jurassic Park. Uh, what was that, 93? Pretty sure. I still have the ticket in a jewelry box. So there was this weird moment where like from third grade on, I was going to go to school for biology or engineering and I was really focused on this and I, I didn't have any of the, you know, I didn't have the luxury of having family in the industry. And uh, I was also told that you can't make a living through arts or entertainment. But the odd thing is, is I grew up out here and I could get on my bike and literally bike to where they're shooting Star Trek and it's some alien land, but it's like Chatsworth. <laughs> it's really not that amazing. So I'm like, these guys are doing it. And I hung around, you know, I drove my bike up on the set a few times and, you know, stole a sandwich here and there. Not really, but they'd let me have a sandwich. Uh, and I just got really fascinated with the world. And it was really weird because also leading up to this, I had all this artwork. I had all the uh, original portfolios of Ralph McQuarrie's uh, Star Wars designs. I knew what production artwork was. The term concept design I don't think even existed. There was no clear path. None of the art schools um, had an entertainment design class even at the time. But, uh, you know, Jurassic Park landed and it blew me away. There were dinosaurs on screen and I mean, I can still vividly remember what this movie did to me. Uh, in it, it basically led me on a path where if I was going to turn away later, you know, upon graduating high school, turn away the collegiate journey that I had basically laid out for me and scholarships offered, I wanted to work on big films and I wanted to work with the big dogs. You know, I wanted to work under the biggest directors in the world and be on those productions. And what really happened was a few years of poking and prodding. I did a couple of odd jobs between like 17 and 19. And then 19, I got a break at a studio that actually led to a career. Um, but I did lots of weird video game work and shoveled rubber frogs and other stuff before that. And this was an interesting moment. Um, I'm showing this particular image because this is actually going to come back during this presentation. Uh, from a pr pretty fun and interesting moment in my career. So, the film work. So, you know, when we're dealing with creating a giant orange cat that performs, you know, you're building it from the skeleton up. Skeleton muscles through skin, you're doing something dynamic. Uh, we're not just building a big fluffy CG model and trying to animate it. We have a whole dynamic muscular system, so and that's properly rigged, so it looks good. Now, I'll show you a few slides from a couple films. But the particular job that I had, um, or at least the job I created eventually, was really involved with lots of aspects of the studio, shooting reference images, being involved with different um, departments, art departments, uh, animation departments, tech anim departments, uh, capturing images on set, capturing images in my living room. It just depended on what was needed. 
so really, a lot of the experience I've had, I, I've worked on uh, over 200 films at this point, and I've shot a lot of animals with a camera, not something weird. Um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey, and I think that's what I can provide you guys, is I've, I've had sort of a really strange career and adventurous lifestyle uh, based off of that. So, you know, there's a, what was he, Mr. Tinkles from Cats and Dogs. That was one of the first things I ever worked on. He was full CG. Dr. Doolittle 2, remember that monkey? Alvin and the Chipmunks, a little bit fantasized there, not too on point. That's more about humanizing the characters. This is actually from Charlotte's Web. Um, though the studio I worked for uh, back then also won an Academy Award for Babe Pig in the City before I worked there. The glorious and very not real orange cat. Scooby-Doo was actually really interesting uh, because the very first uh, animation test we did for the studio, we actually just made a photo real dog. And we had to kind of go cartoony from there. Uh, and that was sort of... Um, a reoccurring theme from time to time. There's the little thrasher from Riddick, Marmaduke. And coming up to uh, working on Narnia with Aslan, and specifically, there's a visual effects supervisor named Bill Wessenhofer who currently, I think, just wrapped on the World of Warcraft film. Um, he's really good at doing creature animation. And this was another instance where early on when we got going with this production, we shot a test in front of our studio with two of our employees' daughters, and we put a CG lion next to the kids, just walking. And at the studio, we got hate mail, because Disney did some article and showed a quick time somewhere, and we got mail like, how can you let these little girls go unsupervised with this lion? And we're like, what the, why are we getting this? But the thing is, is we did our job. We made a real lion. Now, we actually dialed it back quite a bit. Um, you can see he's a little bit more shiny and has a very expressive face. And this is, this is interesting for me because when I still watch things like Jurassic Park, the CG still holds up. And I actually feel that way about Narnia because at least this first one, um, you'll see his expressions and his performance will hold up over time, and his fur is really lovely. I also just imagine Liam Neeson just quoting lines from Taken now, so <laughs> it just, uh, <laughs> it's kind of fun. And then we won a, an Academy Award for Best Visual Effects on Golden Compass. It was the same team, essentially. Uh, it was a lot more critters, a lot more CG, um, a lot more, just everything. That's his uh, polar bear stink face, you know, little teeth. And then another one um, that you guys probably all remember is Life of Pi, um, which was the last, one of the last films I worked at the studio. I left before the, the falling out and all that stuff, so I uh, started my own career. But that was a pretty big performance from a CG creature on the big screen. <clears throat> so where did I come in? Where did I come in with a lot of this? Well, I've shot lions, tigers, and bears, uh, and a whole hell of a lot of other things. That's actually the bear from Borat, if you guys saw that film. Uh, it's the ice cream truck bear. But there's been a great deal of, this is shortly after this raccoon viciously killed a lizard, by the way. So, so this like, hey! Uh, this is a hyena um, that I shot on Evan Almighty. Interestingly enough, I have not had many issues with animals on set. I've dealt with everything you can imagine. And the hyena actually has a 12 gauge chain around his neck, as do some of the bigger cats and whatnot. But this is the only animal that like is looking at you and it, you know it wants to eat you. It's, it's got the upper body strength to just destroy you. 
He was bigger than me. Oh, he was about that tall standing. And then long. Yeah, he, they get bigger than this one too. This was the movie Hyena. But you could see that the trainer and the other trainer on the chain sometimes <laughs> would be like, all right, let's just not go kill people right now. Some of these weren't so bad. Um, there's another big cat with a chain on him. But this guy nuzzled right up on my leg, give him a noogie, he was happy. Some interesting monkeys. Porcupine. Just uh, kind of like a dog, really. Um, it's really sort of a weird tragedy. It's, it's almost like a Disney sort of film where you can't touch it. You have to touch it with gloves, and like all it really wants is just like to be fed and touched. So it just goes around begging, and it's, it's really weird. It's very Shakespearean, maybe, in some way. And shooting lots of other creatures abroad and getting really tremendous access, uh, which was impressive. Now, I said I didn't have any problem with most animals. Uh, I have had problems with one particular type of animal. I have been bitten on three separate occasions by ostriches. I actually have a permanent dent in my skull from an ostrich hitting me with its, its beak. Uh, and I had one on the shoulder. But the third time, I was actually really close. It was actually this ostrich right here. And you can see why I was probably going to get bit. Because <laughs> I was stupid close. Um, that one came, and I blocked it. I blocked it with my hand. It was, it was an interesting moment. Uh, and you don't get behind ostriches. They'll thrash and kill you very quickly. But um, if you look very closely, you'll see that membrane on his eye. We were trying to shoot the, you know, we had to make a 3D CG real, photo real ostrich, and getting that blink reference is really hard to do because you have to get that micro millisecond moment. So the only way to do that was to hang out with him for like an hour and pray that he didn't hit you again. <laughs> There was this really interesting moment um, on Evan Almighty again. You know, that movie had oh, a couple hundred animals at least, birds. I, I shot probably 50 birds, different types of birds on that film alone. But there was a, a really fun moment for me. You know, I went to Universal Studios when I was a kid. You know, I did the whole tram tour. This is before I was working in the industry. And on this production, they afforded me the opportunity to have an entire soundstage to myself, which was kind of a big deal. It was a big moment for me. And I remember the first day I was there and shooting on this particular setup, I walked out the door, which is uh, to the left of this photo, and the tram light comes by and waves. I'm waving, and I'm like having this incredibly surreal moment where, you know, this is like 2004 or five, and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm working on the lot. Like, this is a cool moment. It was a big deal. It was a nice, nice thing. Don't know how to describe that, but you get good feels sometimes. And we had every type of animal in there. And we also had them on the, uh, the ARC set. Not many people get to put a bunch of animals on an actual ARC, but <laughs> it was an interesting experience. Zebras, zebus which I think Neville would actually love because this is, Neville and Ian actually would love the hell out of this because he's just got a comical hump on him. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. And he's got a little waddle. He's got a double waddle. Yeah. That animal does not make sense to me in any way, shape, or form. If you chop him off at the midsection, he looks like he's front heavy, right? But nature, man. Ah, uh, the male alpaca, possibly the, the ugliest <laughs> smile. Uh, impressive spitting distance. Uh, the female was rather cute. She had nice poofy hair. This is Ty. Um, this elephant's been in movies for quite a while, and this is actually something I find really interesting. I've now been in the industry long enough doing certain types of work, either on set or behind a camera where I've worked with animals multiple times. So this is an elephant that I've worked with a few times. Uh, and this is also the elephant, if you remember the Banksy uh, pink elephant installation, that's the same elephant. 
one thing that was interesting about having the sound stage, you know, this is a big, big sound stage, uh, almost, you, know, you think football field almost. We would have animals come in one at a time so we could work with them, get our animation reference, shoot our photos. But this kangaroo got loose, so we just chased the kangaroo until it got exhausted. I mean, we could not catch the thing. It was going to one corner, and kangaroos can move a lot faster than we can. And it's pretty impressive. And I was, I was at this really weird moment. I'm like, this is actually kind of kismet because this is great animation reference. It's better than him being on this little platform and trying to get him to hop. He's shooting around, so I grabbed my camera and got some more footage, so it was interesting. We had another interesting thing where a lion got loose on one of these sets one day, but it turned out it was just, on the, uh, on the production sets there for animal movies, especially if you're working with dangerous animals, presumably dangerous animals, you have a safety cage, usually by where the camera is. So your job is to get to the safety cage. Most people ran out of the stage instead. So what happened was there was this gigantic set and a lion that's loose in there, and no one knows where it is. So at some point, the trainers walked in, and uh, we all, we found the lion just like, you know, bathing in the light, like under the lights, just like asleep. Not a big deal. People just panicking. You know, Manny's, Manny's gonna be demoing, is he, Manny's doing today? So this is Tony, um, he's also a master falconer, and he was responsible for flying the birds. This is a vulture in this case. And uh, it's really interesting seeing the relationship between a bird trainer and the bird. Um, where this is actually shot is at the, the hidden soccer field at the Universal lot. And Tony literally would like put the vulture out and it would just go, I mean, far away. And eventually come back, you know, just to get a little morsel. Uh, that he's got a little nugget bag of some sort. It was really interesting uh, learning a little bit about that and getting closer to that and seeing that behavior uh, really close, um, just is really informative in terms of inspiring sort of an animated performance. Yeah. I mean, just that position alone, I don't know if I've ever seen a vulture landing like that that close. This was an interesting moment um, ahead of Mr. Popper's penguins, uh, we had tremendous access at uh, SeaWorld for the, um, the penguin habitat. And this is a Gen 2 penguin, which the movie ended up using. It was before we actually decided on a species for the, the movie. So one of the days I was down there, they actually put me in the habitat. And the trick was it was still winter for them, so it had to be somewhat dark which isn't really good for shooting photos. So the concept was to put me in the habitat so I could keep, be calm with them and get as many shots as I could. But, you know, quickly I found out that like penguins are extremely curious. They're basically dogs. They like getting pet on the belly. The, the little macaronis are cartoon characters practically. They look like little bowling balls with beaks. Um, but they're, they're really interesting birds and you can actually, uh, um, Examine their social habits, their little structures, their little clicks. It's almost like you're watching like a bird high school sort of thing go on. Uh, it was a pretty tremendous moment. This is actually not something from a movie, but this is uh, an albino peacock, which many people haven't seen. Uh, I've had peacocks in my life for years, oddly. Uh, in three places I lived, and this was not where I lived. This is actually where my parents live up north. Um, they just randomly had this albino peacock in their yard. Go figure. I did used to live in a place called Box Canyon, though, where someone set loose a whole bunch of peacocks, and every now and again, you'd get 30 peacocks on your roof. I'm not exaggerating. Um, and it is... You think, oh, it's gonna sound like, you know, reindeer on the roof. No, it's actually terrifying. It is claws and just scratching and thumping and they, they make this loud sound. It is impressive. Um, but she was a sweetheart. She actually would let you get close to her and all that. So um, and I've never seen a, an albino peacock since. So you know, just almost, almost feels like royalty, you know? That's what I feel like. I feel like a princess. I feel like a princess. That's good for video, right? 
My parents also uh, have been raising chickens up north and occasionally get these really bizarre ones. And I go up there to take photos of just random stuff sometimes just to influence some of the work I'm doing. But this one was named, I think, Cher. And I keep looking at this thing and it just does not make sense to me. Like, how do you function with all that? <laughs> I mean, if you designed a creature like that for a studio and said like, I'm just gonna do feathers with a beak, it wouldn't really work. You know, like a fist, feathers, beak, done. And you can't see the eyes, you can't see anything else. But it's really interesting the variety that you get and the, the actual colors on the feathers I've never seen that on a chicken before. That's kind of stunning. I mean, specifically this stuff. So that actually changed. Um, there's a few photos I've taken over the years that have kind of actually changed my perspective on how I design. And this has actually changed the way I was thinking about feathers. You know, like you think about parrots, maybe some of the more exotic birds. But this is a brown swatch with almost like ink dipped tips. And it's, uh, it's quite lovely. Ah, uh, the special moments of working with giraffes. Not impressed by me, clearly. This guy here, um, he has now passed away, but this guy was named Ivan. And he was the largest giraffe in the Western Hemisphere. And I took this photo and brought it in to kind of give you a sense of scale, but there's a photo of me following this where his head's next to me and you'll, you'll get the idea. When I was first greeted by Ivan, I was in uh, this wildlife park and you see him come up over the ridge and it looks like something happening in slow motion. But as he gets closer, you start realizing he is covering a crazy amount of ground. It's like, boof, boof. It's like a living giant. Ivan's got crazy calcium deposits on his head. And he, he looks a little bit different than the other giraffes. But he's got some age and he's got these growths. Um, I can't remember how old he was. He was like 19, I think, when I shot him, or 17. But um, he gets real close and you can feed him and things like that. And he's got this tongue that will literally wrap around your head. Um, and I know from experience. That gives you an idea of how big that is. I mean, his, his head is basically the size of my body. And that's, that's pretty amazing if you think that he's bending down and I'm on a truck. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Uh, interestingly enough, <laughs> uh, Ivan had a funny relationship with this water buffalo Bucky. And I saw this, but I wasn't able to get a picture of it, but there is a picture of this on the internet. But uh, Ivan and Bucky had this strange relationship where they both would kind of like play with each other. And something that Ivan would do is he would walk up to Bucky and put his hoof on his snout. And it's this really strange thing where you see this gigantic towering giraffe pressing down on a water buffalo. And if you guys have watched any like late night Discovery Channel stuff, like, the water buffalo is the most dangerous thing in the wild. It's between that and the hippo, it seems, always. Um, but it's just like this weird thing because the water buffalo is, like, bowing down. And it's this weird behavior that I'm like, does this happen in nature? It's really strange. And this went on for a long time. This wasn't uncommon. So it was interesting. Another special moment, and this is actually kind of why I showed that triceratops image from Jurassic Park. Um, Nola, who's still down in San Diego, beautiful, beautiful rhino. Um, she has a hormone deficiency, she's too old to breed, things like that. Um, <laughs> but the day I'm there shooting reference with the trainers of the park, they're telling me, hey, rhinos will kill you, like, a lot. They're just giving me left and right, like, rhinos are bad. We drive by this broken down safari truck that literally has a dent in it because the mama rhino who just had the newborn rhino, which we can't even get close to, destroyed the truck. And I'm like, well, okay. So we, we go through the park, we go through the park, and we see this rhino laying down on the ground. And one of the trainers looks to me and says, do you want to get out and 
you know, feed it some apples. I'm like, you just spent the last hour telling me that I will die if I cl get close. And then this, this is the moment where it's like, this is a trust ex exercise. No, no, this is a special rhino. What's that mean? This is the special rhino that makes me live? So I'm not one to, sh you know, turn down an opportunity like this because how often do you get to go play with a rhino, like up close and personal? Hop out of the truck with a basket of apples, and I mean like a basket. And she's just laying down, and we <laughs> bring out like a broom, and we're scrubbing her, and it's a crazy thing, and she's totally comfortable with it, and it has allowed me to get this close to her. I mean, it's really impressive. I mean, right there. And at some point, it was okay to like touch. And they said stay close to the truck, so I was always kind of within jumping distance of like, oh my God, I'm gonna die. But she didn't do anything like that. Um, she ate apples on the ground. We'd like give her one, and she wouldn't even get up. She's just like, thanks, you know, that kind of thing. And then there was this weird moment where I leaned up on her in that very triceratop sort of moment, and it was really fascinating. You know, I was like, oh, I'll hear the heartbeat. You know, like, that'll be the thing. But I heard a lot more than that. I heard the heartbeat. I heard other things moving. I heard the inhale and the exhale of the lungs. It gave me a whole different perspective. And also having my face pressed up against the body, just the texture of the skin was a whole different ball game at that point. There was a lot of variety to it. It wasn't, it wasn't one note across the body. It's very much like, you know, if you are a human and if you walk barefoot a lot, you get tougher feet, for instance, or you have, you know, soft skin on your face and you know, harder skin on your hands. It just kind of opened a door where I was thinking a lot more about what's going on in the animal. And at this point, anatomy was a big part of my life anyways through design in the studio. A very, very special moment. Here's working on Marmaduke. Marmaduke looking cool. This was actually an interesting job. I'm a big dog person and being trapped up in Vancouver to work on a movie with 300 dogs on set was pretty interesting. They tell you you don't want to work on movies with kids or animals. Um, there's something else in there, like water, I think, or something. But this was awesome. There were dogs everywhere, and they were all just like super awesome dogs that were trained. But the one thing that you can't really tell, and you kind of see it there, that dog's huge. That dog, when it jumps up, my ch his chest is in my face. And it's, uh, it was very impressive. And there was a baby Marmaduke, too. He, um, he had a puppy or something, and there were two other full-size ones. A very, very special animal who I've actually photographed seven or eight times now for different purposes. This is Crystal. Um, she's been in all the Night at the Museum movies. She's been in, if you see a monkey like this on TV, it's her or Candy. It's one of these two monkeys, basically. But Crystal's, uh, the trainer describes her as a little, like, lobotomized four-year-old, which is terrifying, actually, but because <laughs> it's like a zombie child. But in reality, like, she's just really happy. She chirps at you. You can literally put your keys somewhere and say, go get my keys, and she'll go get your keys and bring them to you. She knows what you want. And she remembers so when I didn't work with her for like two years and saw her again, she gets excited and she smells you, she knows, and it's, it's really powerful. And I have her doing all these sassy poses and eventually wearing a spacesuit. <laughs> super, super freaking awesome monkey. And I mean, for those of you who haven't made a movie or anything like that, you know, you put marks on the ground for actors to hit. And it's pretty much the same thing with trained animals. You put down markers for them to hit. But Crystal can do super complicated stuff. And she can give you really interesting performances. And it's a weird balance because we also had to make a CG version of her as well. And I shot more animation reference for this monkey than I have for anything else because she does so much stuff. She's got a lot of expression. And she likes to ham it up for the camera. An interesting moment uh, in my career, which was completely fascinating, I found myself in one year working on three separate films that had werewolves in it. Must have been the time. Um, and I'm gonna show you the two cool ones, not the third weird one. Um, this is from Cabin in the Woods. 
And this is, uh, this is obviously a suit. There's a man in a green uh, a frog suit under there. And what you have is an animatronic face. That's actually a remote control. And it was terrifyingly awesome. And what I particularly like about this film, if you saw Cabin in the Woods, it was sort of over the top. It was sort of a gaggy sort of concept. But at the same time, they did a lot of things very, very well. I like how they tackled the legs. Rather than just going with human legs like most werewolves, they actually went for the dog style leg and they actually went through the trouble of actually having the VFX removal of the, the actor's legs. It was very cool and very convincing on screen. You obviously would have to change suits if you were facing a different way, but it looked badass. And I mean absolutely terrifying. Another interesting moment, um, a very special moment uh, was working on Wolfman with Anthony Hopkins, uh, directed by Joe Johnson, who used to be a concept artist at ILM, by the way. Uh, and that's Rick Baker right there. Uh, it's my first time, oddly, working on anything that Rick Baker was doing directly. And seeing him, you know, he's the master of movie makeup as far as I'm concerned. And he, uh, he did some stunning work and I was able to just kind of see how he's problem, problem solving this, this makeup on Anthony Hopkins, which needs to be really good for close-ups. It needs to hold that much. And it's very impressive what they pulled off. It doesn't look like enough, like a, a lot of work rather, um, but when you look at his snarl and you don't see things coming off the nose and you actually see those tension marks coming up across the zygomatic pull up through the cheeks, that's pretty damn cool work. Also, the hair application is nuts good. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's insanely good. So if it can hold it this, this distance, that's, uh, that's pretty good makeup. That's all I can say. Interesting moment for me on set. The first day I shoot Anthony Hopkins, he's in his full wolf makeup already. And we have like a 3D camera set up. I'm doing this weird cross-polarized texture photography thing. We have, it's like four different setups for, you know, for me to shoot him and plus the stuff that he needs to shoot on set. And he, he gets in front of my gray, gray backdrop for the first uh, cross-polarized shoot. And he tells me, I feel like I'm looking through a time traveling mirror. And I knew what he meant. He's like, he thought he was looking at a younger version of himself. And I, was, I just quickly went like, oh, I'm pretty sure I shaved today because he's in full wolf gear. And it was kind of a funny moment. But it, we, we looked at some old photos and apparently I looked like him when he was younger quite a bit. So it's a nice little fun thing. Here's another uh, example. And this is actually taking a few elements to make something. Uh, this was a tortoise named Charlie who's just really big and that's about it. But examining his scales, it, uh, it was necessary because we were working on a movie that needed to make gigantic dinosaurs, which I honestly was very excited for. Um, that was for Land of the Lost. There was also some really interesting other stuff going on in there. Um, using some special types of photography, I was able to reveal quite a bit of color in his shell. I don't think you, unless <laughs> you've taken drugs, you probably have never seen a tortoise shell that looks like that. Um, but that's cross-polarized, and that's the actual hues that can come out of it, the, the actual natural color. Combined with some lizard reference, we were able to make this grumpy character, and that's actually the maquette. So you can kind of see where certain things would be getting used for the textures. Yeah. So, how am I doing on time? Awesome. Exploring. Uh, I'm a big advocate of living the adventure. And this is going to be something, if you guys are, some of you are students here, primarily. I know some of you are strangers. <laughs> well, no, I met some of you at the gallery show on Friday, um, or at least saw a couple faces. Um, you know, when I was growing up and I started hearing more and more about the ILM art department before I was even at that level, I would hear about these like, oh, they'd go off and, you know, go on a safari and go shoot reference and stuff like that. 
when I was able to do that, I totally understood it. You know, you have to go out there, you have to feel it, you have to see what's going on because you might take a picture of something or even see a picture that you've Google searched, but you'll miss the weird muscle fire that you might have caught. I remember I was shooting a tiger once and it gave me this like weird expression. And if I wasn't rolling video on the thing with the camera right in its damn face, I don't know how I would have ever seen it because I've never seen it before. It was very powerful. So what I do in my spare time is I go out and kind of explore. Um, I'm kind of fortunate to go out and do that kind of thing. This here is a herd of sheep that I came across up the five freeway. I was actually taking some landscape photos and over a ridge there were just lots of sheep everywhere. It was a weird moment and they were very interested in everything I did. But something that I remember, and this is, this is totally not production related, but this is actually has influenced some of my concept design. When I look at those faces, they all have different characters. I could put different characters on all of them. I can, I can say this guy's kind of aloof. I can say this guy's kind of serious. This guy's kind of shy, but maybe inquisitive. I can see certain aspects of that. They all, you know, it's generally the same skull, but just like us, they have a little bit of variation. And uh, it's, it definitely, you know, kind of gives you that sort of animation, push, pull, tug, stretch, bend uh, mentality to kind of figure out, you know, what type of characters could they be? So I, and I enjoyed it. I was having a lot of fun. I took a lot more photos and I won't bore you with them, but <laughs> another weird moment out taking landscape photos in the middle of nowhere after a big fire, by the way. Um, I went out to go shoot like scorched earth and I found this one tree out in the middle of this field that looked just amazing. It was the only thing that didn't burn down. I'm taking some photos, it's quite windy. I have the camera, a tripod. I'm taking nice photos, I think. And I hear a noise. And I turn around and there's an emu behind me. I need to stress, I am in the middle of nowhere absolutely nowhere. So apparently this emu got loose and we walked him back to some, someone's house and it was, a, it was a weird thing. But if you can imagine that fiery eye staring at you, and I didn't jump. <laughs> there's, there's no reason to jump because I thought I was already dead, you know. Yeah, it was an interesting moment. Another fun one, uh, during one of the shoots for uh, the Yogi Bear film, I found myself up in Oregon in a strange place that was growing Christmas trees. And I was out one day on my own, just kind of taking my own shots. And I've just never seen anything like this before. I was like, wow, this looks really crazy. But something that was even crazier was when I was looking at these things at a distance, I saw movement. And I was like, what's going on in there? Like, I couldn't quite see it because the trees were kind of covering it. So I finally got up and drove to one of these Christmas tree farms. And inside of the farm were lots of alpacas everywhere. And I thought it was so bizarre. <laughs> and it was just interesting. It was, and now, you know, I've, I think of Christmas trees and alpacas forever because it's like where they live for me. Yeah. And alpacas are hilarious. One interesting thing growing up, and I alluded to the amount of camping and hiking and whatnot, um, I took a survival class uh, when I was very young. Uh, they taught us things about you know, throwing spears through moving hoops, uh, how to properly throw a tomahawk or any ax, uh, archery, just stuff like that. It was fun times, but one of the interesting things the instructor taught us was how to sneak up on deer. And I've snuck up on deer actually a few times. I remember once in Sequoia, I snuck up next to one and leaned on it. And that was interesting. It's a very interesting moment being that close to a wild animal because you really don't know what's going on, but you get the sense that you can generate comfort. And the secret really to it is not making direct eye contact with them and kind of pretending you're doing what they're doing, like you're grazing. So I was in this really beautiful place and I just saw this awesome flock of deer and their baby ones and 
it was awesome. It started off small, and then more showed up. And I had my camera out, and I was pretending to eat this, you know, nice green grass. I was getting closer, watching some of their behavior. They took notice of me several times, but it was really interesting because the only time they really were frustrated with me is when my shutter went off on my camera. And they were shaking their heads and having fun. That's saliva in the air, sticking its tongue out at me. And I got pretty close to this doe, and then suddenly the male showed up. And this was the most awkward moment because if you can imagine me here and where the edge of that stage is, I turn to my right and this thing's just sitting there looking right at me. It, I don't know if it's angry, it could be about to jump. I showed that I was not showing any threat and I definitely probably wasn't emitting any fear. But that's, I mean, that's right there, right in the middle of the forest, a really interesting moment. And that guy, he's, he's got some horns, he's got some antlers, he could have probably beat me up pretty good. So there was this interesting moment where I got what I was getting, you know, I was like, I want to take your picture. I took my shots and I gave him his authority back and moved away. And that's how we did not have an altercation. And then I went to my, hike down to my rental car and uh, how was that? Another interesting one to sneak up on, a uh, little bit further away than the deer, uh, was this American Eagle up in Washington. And driving along the ro road, you know, you, you see these birds everywhere. And this one eagle was moving around. I was really keen to get close on it. And there's like 30 photos leading up to this where I'm really far away. But I am impressed because what started to happen was there was a light drizzle and he let me get really close. And that's pretty abnormal for a bird like this. And I don't know, it was just an interesting moment. And I don't know many people who get really close to like a wild bird like that, so. Another peculiar moment was there's, there's an area in California called the Salton Sea. And I found myself down there during a pelican migration where there were thousands of pelicans. I have never seen anything like this in my life. And I, if I could describe the noise, the, the chatter, the, the hum, whatever you want to call it, I, it was just, it was weird and mesmerizing. I also noticed that there were some behavioral notes that they were doing in this little outcrop. There, were, there was a big focus on one area. I'm going to show you something moderately graphic, but there was a, a dead pelican on the ground. And I finally was able to make my way out to it to take this strangely morbid landscape shot. Um, and it's an interesting reminder that you, know, you are dealing with animals. And the weirder part was they were eating their own. It was freaking me out. But it wasn't totally new to me because when I was a kid, we raised those feeder mice and I saw terrible things as a child. You see cute little baby mice and you see mother mice eating baby mice and then you're like, all right, I'm gonna go to bed, never again. <laughs> so, yeah. Another thing uh, that I've really enjoyed exploring and I've shot tons of reference, this is actually a reference for an X-Men film. It's a dead moth but their wings have very fascinating spectral patterns um, that we don't get to see without being stupid, stupid close to them. I think this is 10 times the magnification of real life here. And you don't even know what you're looking at, but you can see this interesting pattern. It almost looks like fish scales to me. Uh, and uh, It's definitely influenced some of my designs, you know, having a little dot here and also just the bleeding of color. This was another big one. This definitely influenced the design of something that made it to the screen. This is just a standard orb weaver spider. They're pretty common in California. They grow pretty big. They're a target for birds because birds just are like, that's just a big nugget of food. And they're good spiders. They don't hurt humans. They eat bun bunches of bugs and stuff like that. But I've never been this close to one. And I had no idea. I've had tarantulas and stuff as a kid, but I had no idea orb weavers were this hairy. Like he's got an actual haircut and he's got this beautiful ornate pattern on his, on his rear 
But the other thing that was really striking was that translucent leg thing going on. And that definitely affected something where we had a spider that was emitting light from the inside and how it would traverse through his body. Very interesting effect. Um, also, if you could think about scaling this thing up, like make this thing a giant spider, one of the things I was always fascinated by was, this guy's got crazy little spikes on his legs. He's like a death machine. He's just waiting for like something to get caught in him. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen an orb weaver like capture something, but I saw one take down a bee once and it was like, whoa. Little cool, little almost like jewel-like creature, but when it comes down to business, it's, it's gonna eat you. So that's kind of leading up to where Noman is right now with this, this workshop. Um, about a month ago, uh, Travis called me up and had me go visit the, uh, the California uh, Wildlife Center. And we had some pretty interesting stuff go down recently in California where there are a bunch of um, malnourished, weak, injured, and dead sea lions and elephant seals on the coast. So I went up there and uh, hung out and actually even witnessed some bird x-raying and helped out with that and had a good time. I've been around animals my entire life, so none of this was really odd for me. Um, and then I think that was actually really refreshing for the people who work at the, the station because there's a very touristy vibe sometimes and there's also the concept that they're wild animals and they really want to bite your face off sometimes. <laughs> but these guys are pretty cool. This one, was very close to being released. You can see by how healthy he is, swimming around in the pool. And just for me as a visual artist, what I'm noticing for the first time being this close to sea lions in captivity rather than nature, and that's an important difference. Look at how shiny that is. Isn't that cool? That's hair. It's blowing my mind. Here's one of the little guys. Now you can see he was, he, was, uh, he was there for like a week, I think, at that point. So he had his little marks. He was very malnourished. They didn't know if he was gonna survive, actually. But he's been kicking butt. There's some elephant seals singing opera. And by singing opera, they make the most disgustingly horrible sound. It's dumb and dumber brought to life, actually. It's just the most annoying sound. But they're awesome. And they look adorable. But if you get much closer than this, he will happily bite your head off. Some of the feeding time, eating some fish. Now, I had a pretty special moment, um, and this is more about going out and exploring and seeing things. Uh, chartered a small boat um, up in the Burrard uh, Inlet near Georgia Strait outside of Vancouver. And we went out. I was actually more interested in seeing whales. Uh, my whole goal, I was like, I gotta go see some whales today. And we ended up just going out for hours and we found so many amazing things. And this moment right here, we actually killed the motors. And we just saw these sea lions just having this weird like, it almost looked like their bellies were full and they were just kind of playing with each other kind of tiredly, uh, like they were exhausted. And there was this entire audience of birds in the background just kind of on the swell. It was just an interesting moment and it was very scenic. And Without any sound, all you hear is the ocean and the occasional just splash of a flipper. It's, it's really interesting. It's influenced a lot of audio cues for me about the stillness of waters like that. There were also areas where they would try to sleep or scratch or whatever, and the seagulls would just not leave them alone at all. I like that one because he looks like the, the thinker. But these guys are pretty much apt. You know, they're just taking a nap. It almost looks like, like an explosion went off and they just kind of all just fell down. But in reality, they're just getting comfy on these rocks. And I'm trying to imagine myself as a creature like this with the dexterity of just the long body and the fins climbing these rocks. It's fascinating when you actually see it in person and it gives you that sort of, all right, I could slink around like that if you tied me up in a big tube. A lot of sunbathing, even though there wasn't much sun to be had. But uh, coming around the bend, 
we saw these guys also in seductive poses. <laughs> but this dude was my favorite. This is an alpha male sea lion out in the wild. Nothing else was near him on this rock. This was his territory. And it was, this was about as close as we can get, and he's making some sound right there. But I've never actually been this close to one of these before. Um, and I had no idea that their coats were so dense and multifaceted. It's almost like this deeper burgundy wine color. Uh, and you can see it gets darker around the head a little bit. Their behavior is really interesting, and that, that sort of arched pose is very big, and he's basically expressing his territory. He's letting people know that, like, guys, get away from my rock. This is my rock. And it was his rock, because I don't know how he got up there. <laughs> I really don't. The other thing I'm, you know, fascinated with, I, I used to be a Coast, uh, Cousteau kid. I don't know if you know Jacques Cousteau or any of that. Um, I came this close to actually going out on his boat, the Calypso, for a summer. Um, still kind of kick myself for not doing that, but it worked out for me. Um, but Under the Ocean is interesting, and we've seen the net result of a few films like The Abyss exploring those concepts, but when you start thinking about jellyfish or various other sea creatures, it's a whole different ball game. You're dealing with essentially alien life way outside of what we're used to. And uh, I've always been fascinated by creatures like this uh, because if you, as a designer, were set out squarely to design sea life forms and you turned in floating mushroom spindly things, that probably wouldn't sell unless someone knew what jellyfish were. They would probably be expecting fish, you know? And there's a lot more variety down there. And there's even weirder stuff than that. And there's even weirder fish than that that lay flat on their sides and burrow. It's, it's a bizarre world down there. So um, my note here was to implore you to really get inspired by some undersea creatures, which leads me to my get inspired bit. I have a couple old sketches I, I brought in that I thought would be interesting. I got in trouble in second grade, and it still bothers me. No, uh, <laughs> I, I stayed with a bee as it was dying on the playground. Uh, it was a very strange thing, like bell rang, and I, it was dying by uh, where the pool was at the school. And I just stayed with it until it died, and I kept just asking myself questions like, I wonder what happened before it got here. I wonder what it's world like. And I started thinking like, oh man, they, think, they see things differently. Like their, their, their world's big versus my world, which is kind of normal to me. You know, your POV changes. I started thinking about all sorts of stuff and I remember, I think I sketched this in 2008, I didn't date it. Um, I, I remember thinking of that when I did this little weird drawing where it was like suddenly maybe the bee talked to me, which did actually influence something I later created. Um, it's an interesting thing, and I also have some weird floating skull, uh, or fro uh, floating crown thing over him to maybe suggest royalty. But it's interesting when you start thinking about the perspective of the animals and what their day-to-day -day lives are, and especially their short lifespans. It's a whole different thing. Another sketch, this one, 2006? Uh, I remember the sketchbook I did this one in, but I was having fun with elephants flying for a minute, and it was sort of like reinventing Dumbo, and I always wanted Dumbo to be like a micro dog size with like weird reptilian dragon wings, and I used to draw these little elephants, and I could not find the sketchbook to do <laughs> more scans, but there's probably a dozen of them in that book, and I just thought it was just the coolest thing to have these like little plump elephants flying around, and you'll see how I'm moving. That's the whole thing, and when you're dealing with animation and maybe bringing something to life like that, you know, the concept design is one thing, and that general sketch is just the initial inception, right? Or conception, whatever you want to call it. Um, but then you have to actually think about the performance and how it moves, and you have to flesh it out a bit. And that's where actually studying the animal movement is more important. This guy is really interesting. 
little teeny gecko. How crazy is that eye? That looks like Lord of the Rings on fire. Sauron's here. But also, check out the spikes coming out of the brow. That almost doesn't make any sense either. I was uh, completely baffled by that for a while, and I, I love reptiles because there's a lot of variety. And I'm currently working on something that requires me to design some dragons, so I brought some reptile images in. They're also somewhat inspired by Jurassic Park in some ways. But for me, if I never saw an eye like this, I don't know if I would ever design something like that with all of those sort of red veins going across. Because what you and I know as an eye, especially for reptiles, is either a black orb or something closer to what we have, right? And the occasional weird looking eye. Here's a lizard enjoying his tongue. But this lizard has no intent. And when I see an image like this, I feel like he is stalking me. Don't you? Why? Well, it's body posture. And it's the same things that make good performance on screen by an actor or an animated character real. A little bit closer. This reminds me of the, uh, the kitchen shot in Jurassic Park where uh, the raptor comes up to the window, the circular window, a little bit. Now we get a really close look at that eye. Do you guys feel like he's friendly? No, probably not. Even though that lizard doesn't even know what expressions are and probably has never been outside of survival mode, there is no friendly expression for a lizard, if you think about it. I had a Nile monitor when I was a kid, it was a big, big lizard. And that thing would actually like curl up next to you for your body heat on the floor, as long as I was. But this makes you think bad things, really bad things. But in reality, he just, he just wants a carrot. But take a look at this, and getting up close like this is so powerful. Look at the, the, the eyelash, if you will, the scales around that area, just the texture on that weird eye. It's, it's very powerful to examine things at this level. You know, it's nice to do it at a Google search and whatnot, but you, know, you guys can go out to a zoo, you guys can go out to a pet store, you could probably slip the pet store guy a few bucks and just like, hey man, can I shoot your gecko? I need it for my finals when you go to Noman. Because <laughs> that's going to probably happen. And this actually gets, you know, brought to the big screen in some way, shape, or form. This guy has a little bit more of a human style of eye. But it is so real that you don't feel it's CG. You know, he's, he's only on screen a little bit, but this actual creature brought to life this way was impressive. I just wish there was more of it. We've seen some really expansive designs on things like Avatar where more of the tropical patterns of, say, birds have been influenced into reptilian skin and smooth at that because they live by water. Very interesting design. Strange beak through teeth as well. Then getting into dragons that have been on screen, we have something like Smaug, who's been a bit more pompous, uh, confident in some weird ways. He's got a bit of a gullet. He doesn't have necessarily the most threatening look because his upper lip is turned up. So you get the feeling that he might be dangerous, but maybe a little bit more bark than bite. Like his teeth aren't even really that threatening. It's an interesting design. Big scary dragon, don't get me wrong. If I saw a big scary dragon, I'd be peeing my pants. Another interesting dragon, and actually one of the better ones recently brought to screen, uh, was in uh, this Harry Potter film, uh, the tied up, um, what was it, Iron Belly or something? I can't even remember. But what I really liked about this dragon is the emotion that was captured in its face. You felt it was a little tortured. In the general animation, you could also see it flinching and they spent a tremendous amount of time actually putting in the, the wear marks for the chains on the creature when you actually watch the film. This was a promotional graphic, but 
It was the prettiest shot of the thing I could find. But do you know what the coolest dragon was ever brought to screen? Not Dragonheart. Reign of Fire. This is the little movie that is very strange because it shouldn't have been made and it was a miracle it got done. I worked for the VFX um, soup on it uh, a few times and this was beautiful animation. Just the flighting, flight mechanics, the dragons on the ground, the aggressiveness, you felt like they had their own performance and character without them ever saying a word and you knew they were trouble. It wasn't like Smaug where there's an actual full conversation from Cumberbatch. It's something far more devious and these things scorched the earth. Very, very cool. Dan DeLue was the uh, VFX supervisor. Name blew out of my head for a second. Very, very cool. And that's kind of what I'm kind of going to wrangle here is when you're bringing a creature like this to the big screen or even Aslan, which is an interesting thing. Or actually, I'll bring up Scooby-Doo because on Scooby-Doo 2, there's a shot with an ATV where Scooby had to put his arms out because they were jumping an ATV. If a dog did that, his shoulders would break. But that's where you have to break reality for the sense of entertainment. This was a very inspired animation. This was, I've seen reptiles. I've seen mammals stalk their prey, which is probably more of what this was inspired by. The sort of, I'm standing my turf, if you guys have seen this scene, you know how he expels with his jaw. Doing a little bit, bit of research, shooting some reference, doing some sketches. I mean, just going down to the zoo and doing some figure drawing of the animals is a very powerful experience. You just have to start documenting things because it will affect the performance of your on-screen character if it ever goes to that. It might just be in an illustration of some sort, sketch, drawing, painting, whatever. But if you have that breadth of knowledge, it becomes more powerful. And at some point, you get a library of information. So when you get your next job and it's like, yo, we got to design some crazy space pig that needs to have some weird helmet, but its snout also has to be out through the helmet so it can clean windows with its snout because that's how this is going on and it's how it tastes things. I'm just coming up with this. That's where you can do it. That's where you can go, you know what, I know how pigs work. Let's make an oversized snout. We gotta do something with the breathing apparatus, maybe breathe through the mouth, maybe plugs in the nose and still have the weird tongue nose thing going on. You can have some fun with it. And that already is inspiring some thoughts for the texture of that as well in my head. So, I don't know, that's about a bunch of stuff from about 15, 16 years working in movies. Uh, specifically the ones with animals. Um, but interestingly enough, like, you know, there's been characters, I showed you the moth wings, that's influenced the X-Men characters, and that was just for the general reference for texture. So we had something to base it off of, something in reality so people will be familiar with it, and that's really what is important here. You can completely design out of left field. You can go hog wild. You can make something look like an amoebic weird thing with a bunch of spikes sticking out of it, but people can't relate and it won't be so scary or friendly. So actually getting more reference and influencing it into your design and maybe merging those two concepts is much more powerful. And for those of you who haven't experienced it yet, the sort of design and revision of art direction is exactly how that goes down. I will end on one story with a concept designer who I actually think is one of the better concept artists in the industry, uh, artists I used to work with named Nick Pugh. Um, he has work here at the campus. Working on Men in Black 2, he was given the task to design these alien creatures for this end sequence, where there's a big locker reveal on a bunch of alien creatures. Nick went away. I like to imagine that he went up into some cave in the Ozarks, you know, and like had a beard on for a couple weeks. But he came back with these large vellum sheets with just characters everywhere. And every single one of them were heroes to me. They were all usable characters. He put so much thought into it. And it wasn't because he was going totally out of left field. You had things that were like, okay, let's take an octopus and a lobster and put them together. And what if that had feathers? He would find a way to make it work. And then there would be 60 of those. 
and it was just incredibly impressive. And back when that happened, where I was just beginning my concept design career and production art career, that was incredibly inspiring because he had a tool set that I could not even comprehend yet, but I did understand how we got there based off of my own experience with creatures in real life. So definitely seek out the inspiration. Are we doing Q&As? Do we do that? Okay, let's do two questions real quick and wrap it up. No questions. I'm wearing boxers. <laughs> break, the, break the air with that one. Oh, God. Yes. What do I look for when shooting for reference? Um, specifically on large studio films, where we often have storyboards and shot notes, I get lots of information about if the character is going to be close to the screen, further away from the screen. If it's going to be really close to the screen, I need to get really close reference and high resolution reference. So that's one thing. Um, when I'm shooting general reference, it's all about doing orthographic angles. You're concerned about flat, usable surfaces rather than artsy shots. Um, you're seeing a little bit of both actually here uh, with some of the images I'm showing you. Um, if it's animation reference, anything you can see, witness, and coerce out of the animal to give you the full breath of what it can do. Um, because there's a lot of things that you can think of, like I can think of what an ostrich looks like running, but not many people have seen an ostrich actually sit down and then get back up, because it's the weirdest, like, uncomfortable, like, thing in the world. But it's amazing. And it's very comical to me, and it would be funny. So um, capturing what you can. Lighting's always a problem with animals. You'll have trainers that'll be OK with strobes, and animals that'll be OK with strobes. But often, you don't want to be firing strobes into the hyena's face that wants to kill you. Yeah, so you, know, you have to work with the light sometimes that you're given in that case. But, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, that's, that's sort of the, the artistic divide there. Um, sometimes when I'm shooting uh, reference and I see something that I can't quite capture with the camera, I'll draw something and provide that to a texture painter or an animator. Um, luckily with the video reference, the animation stuff usually goes, but sometimes if I'm trying to describe like, you know, when the, the animal's mouth is up and a drool comes out from here and then it's like leaves this weird drool beard, like I'll make notes and draw that or provide some sort of reference. Um, sometimes you don't capture everything. Sometimes you have ideas as well. And that's what's really cool. Um, you might have noticed something that you've never captured and might want to utilize as an idea because you've learned about it. Maybe the trainer tells you, or maybe you saw another animal to your right do it, but it never happened again. I've definitely seen animals eat things uh, in a variety of ways. Um, I can think of a hippo with its massive opening of a mouth and then there's just this weird flexing of throat and tongue and jaw and upper mouth and lower mouth. It's kind of gross when you're looking at it really close, but you can make lots of notes about how it moves and it's sort of uh, growth patterns. It's almost like its own organism. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you. Very much. Thank you.